The following are case studies of the carpal tunnel, also including a bifid median nerve, as well as median nerve compression. The bony anatomy associated with the carpal tunnel is complex, but not difficult to learn. Highlighted in blue is the distal radius. Highlighted in green would be the distal ulna. Highlighted in light blue would be the volar lunate. Highlighted in purple would be the volar scaphoid. Highlighted in red is the volar pisiform. In orange, we have the bell-shaped capitate bone. Blue is the volar trapezium bone. In orange is the volar hamate and hamulus landmarks. The white areas are the actual insertion points of the carpal tunnel landmarks. From the red pisiform, attaches to the purple scaphoid. And the orange hook of the hamate crosses over and attaches to the trapezium tubercle. Contained within the carpal tunnel are four deep flexor profundus tendons, four superficial flexor tendon, as well as the flexor pollicis longus tendon on the radial aspect, and the median nerve here in yellow. Crossing over all of these structures, creating the roof of the carpal tunnel is the flexor retinaculum. Probe placement for the proximal carpal tunnel examination is in blue. Here's the corresponding image. Highlighted here in white is the actual flexor retinaculum. Highlighted in purple is the scaphoid insertion, and red is the pisiform. The blue is the lunate surface. In gray are the deep flexor tendons. The light gray are the superficial flexor tendons. The yellow is the median nerve. And in blue, on the far radial aspect bordering the scaphoid, is the flexor pollicis longus, flexor carpi radialis, and the ulnar nerve and ulnar artery, creating Guyen's canal. It is also important to wiggle the fingers to test for laxity in the carpal tunnel. Now scanning from the proximal carpal tunnel to the distal carpal tunnel. Here is the correct probe placement for the distal carpal tunnel. Here we have as a landmark the capitate bone, the bony trapezium and trapezium tubercle being the bony prominence, as well as the hamate and hook of the hamate in red, and the distal flexor retinaculum, shown in light gray here are the deep flexor tendons, gray would be the superficial flexor tendons, and blue would be the flexor pollicis longus, and yellow would be the median nerve. Probe position, long axis carpal tunnel. In long axis, nerves and tendons can look similar, so dynamic flexion will determine nerve from tendon as the tendon will slide beneath the nerve while the nerve stays in a relatively stationary position. Highlighted is the volar lunate surface, followed by the volar capitate surface, which is bell-shaped. The deep and superficial flexor tendons highlighted in white and yellow representing the median nerve. Seen here is the proximal carpal tunnel. Highlighted is the proximal capitate surface, lunate surface, and distal radius in blue. As seen before, we have the deep and superficial flexor tendons followed by the yellow representing the median nerve. To confirm position within the true carpal tunnel, scan medial to lateral for the bony prominences such as the scaphoid surface or pisiform. Here is a case study involving a bifid median nerve with a comparison to the other hand showing no bifid median nerve. When scanning from the carpal tunnel proximally, it is easy to identify where the bifurcation takes place in the forearm, showing that this becomes one nerve. The image on the left shows a char characteristic flattening of the median nerve. 
in this image, there's a fusiform swelling or bulging just proximal to the carpal tunnel. Although not quite four millimeters, there is slight bulging to the symptomatic side in this wrist where the asymptomatic side stays completely beneath the carpal tunnel level. 